May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. The metaphoric connection between faith and seeing gets a little bit overused in Christian circles. We find it in the Bible, we hear it in sermons, and we sing it in songs, especially in the contemporary service where one of my favorite songs is the Michael W. Smith song, Open the Eyes of My Faith, Lord, Open the Eyes of My Faith. It's easy to become numb to the metaphor of seeing and miss its impact in the Gospels and in our lives. But I want to reclaim this language this morning. I want us to hear it anew. Because seeing Jesus, really seeing the Lord, is critical. Not only to the Gospel of Mark, but in our community of faith at St. Michael. Seeing Jesus changes everything and transforms us. In today's Gospel lesson for Mark, we have a story about a blind man named Bartimaeus. He knows who Jesus is. He believes that Jesus can heal him. And he follows Jesus on the way. But before we get into this story, I want to back up. I want to show you how this whole section of the Gospel of Mark is about seeing and not seeing, and how this theme actually culminates in today's story. So two chapters earlier, the people bring a blind man to Jesus and beg Jesus to heal him, but in the story, the blind man is passive. We don't even know if he wants to be there. He doesn't expect anything to happen. People bring him to Jesus. He doesn't bring himself. Strangely, Jesus takes the blind man away from the village, away from his friends. It's like he needs to be separated out for what's about to happen. Then Jesus takes spit, yes, spit, and puts it on the man's eyes and says to him, can you see anything? And in one of the most interesting passages in the Bible, the man responds, I can see people, but they're like sticks moving. So you get this sense there's a vague seeing, but not a crisp, clear seeing. And then Jesus lays his hands on the man's eye again, and his eyesight is restored completely. He can see clearly. So notice that in this case, the process of receiving sight was gradual. It happened in stages. The man wasn't particularly looking for healing. It came to him unexpectedly. That is one way to regain sight. And then immediately after this story, we have the story of Peter identifying Jesus as Messiah. Remember, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, the Lord, the Messiah, which had not been spoken by a disciple to this point. It's a wonderful step of faith, but it's incomplete. Just like that first step of the blind man learning to see, it was like he could see shadows, but he couldn't quite see fully. After Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus explains that he must suffer. He must be rejected, be killed, and rise again. But Peter, in that initial phase of seeing, can only see so far. He takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. This is not the way the Messiah story is supposed to go. Peter's reverting to old patterns and behaviors of blindness. But Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter's beginning to see Jesus, beginning to see who he is, but haltingly. He can't sustain his vision. Like that blind man who first saw in shapes, Peter can only see the broad outlines of who Jesus is, what he has come to do. The picture is not yet clear. So as this section of Mark continues, there's a whole set of stories about Jesus trying to reveal the truth of his identity, about who he is, and the disciples consistently being unable to see it. Jesus wants them to see that he is the Son of Man, the Messiah, but not the kind of Messiah they imagine. He will be a Messiah of love to the poor, not a conqueror of Rome. And yet over and over again, the disciples cannot see it. First, it's Peter rebuking Jesus. Then it's the disciples arguing about who is the greatest. Then it's their hardness of heart regarding divorce. Then it's James and John asking to sit next to Jesus when he comes into glory. The disciples have trouble seeing Jesus and knowing how to respond. And now we have the story of Bartimaeus, the blind beggar on the side of the road. Now, I want you to notice a few things about today's story. First, 
It takes place in Jericho where nothing good should happen. It's full of Gentiles. It's unclean, and so certainly God would not be found there. Second, unlike the blind man in the first story, Bartimaeus is not passive. When he hears that Jesus is passing by, he cries out, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. When my wife and I were working at a church in New York City, we wrote a whole musical around this particular story, have mercy on me, Bartimaeus cries out. Bartimaeus doesn't wait for Jesus to come to him. He goes to Jesus. He even uses a messianic title for Jesus, son of David. Again, an act of faith that is larger than the stories that have preceded. Even though Bartimaeus is blind in his eyes, he can see Jesus more clearly than the ones who are following him every day. God has given him sight to perceive the Lord. Jesus hears Bartimaeus crying out and says to the people around him, call him here. And I love these moments when Jesus, there's a din of the crowd, and yet he hears that cry and invites him forward. Or when someone touches his cloak and he stops and he says, someone touched me. We have these moments where Jesus is exquisitely attuned to faith. It's almost like that's what Jesus hears, is the faith around him, regardless of the words. So Jesus says, call him here, and when Bartimaeus hears that Jesus actually wants to see him, do you know what a big deal that is? He is unclean, he is blind, he is in the land of the Gentiles. He throws off his cloak, he jumps up and runs to him, and I have this image that he's not even exactly sure where he's going, and as Chris said in his sermon at nine, it's almost like the crowd is serving as a path for him to find his way to Jesus. But you don't have that passivity, you have that whole being to come to Jesus for healing. Jesus then asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus answers the way God would like us to answer every time God asks us that question. My teacher, let me see again. I'd like you to imagine going through your life, your home, your work, your church, and actually saying as you walk, help me see again. A mantra over and over. Bartimaeus is the ideal disciple. He's aware of his blindness. He knows that Jesus can heal him. He cries out for help, even when others try to stop him, and then he runs to Jesus confident in what Jesus can do. We are now in our stewardship season, our annual giving campaign, and friends, our relationship with money is a very important part of our discipleship. When we follow Jesus, our whole life is transformed, not just the parts we want to turn over, right? We enjoy a pretty song, but we're not, insu- we're not sure we actually want to give sacrificially. This time, this church is calling us to give our whole selves to God's grace and mercy and healing, including our relationship with money. Where are you on the giving journey? Are you like the first blind man, passive, unaware, Do you need Jesus to heal you in stages with a bit more clarity every year? Are you like Peter, making grand gestures of generosity here and there, but fundamentally missing the point and having trouble sustaining faithfulness when things get tough? Or maybe you're like Bartimaeus. You're aware of your vulnerability, and you're ready for Jesus to set you free in your money as well as the other parts of your life. After Bartimaeus asks for what he needs, Jesus replies, go, your faith has made you well. It's as if Jesus is saying, you don't need me to heal you. You're already healed. You already see clearly. Well done, good and faithful servant. But to show others what's happening, to prove, as it were, that something significant has happened, Jesus does restore the man's physical sight. He accomplishes on the outside what was up to that point on the inside. And after we hear that after this encounter with Jesus, Bartimaeus follows Jesus on the way. He becomes a disciple. So when you hear about discipleship and when you think about the disciples of the church, I want you to imagine Bartimaeus, that open-hearted, vulnerable one willing to be healed, following in the path of Jesus. Our annual giving campaign is ultimately not about money. It It is not about how much we can raise. It's not about the good work we can do next year. The annual giving campaign is about discipleship. 
It is about being healed of what ails us and learning to walk in love, particularly with the things that God has given us. After this encounter with Bartimaeus, something shifts. Jesus turns towards Jerusalem and the cross. The placement of the Bartimaeus story in Mark is no accident. He makes it clear once we trust Jesus, once we see who he is, we're not afraid of the hard places. We're not afraid to walk toward the cross because we know that love has set us free. We know that we are raised to new life in God. And when you have that confidence that you've been set free, that you are anchored in love, suddenly nothing seems scary anymore, not even the cross. The next part of our service is the offertory. And it's at this point that we not only give our money, but we also bring the bread, the wine, our whole selves to the communion table. Notice that the offertory is a necessary passageway to approaching the altar and being in communion with Christ. We must surrender ourselves to God. So pray that God will open the eyes of our hearts so that we might see him and one another more clearly. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's sing that one more time together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Amen. Please stand as you're able. Together with Christians throughout the ages and around the world today, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us, let us pray now for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. 
Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died and that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. All right, please be seated. Just a reminder, sometimes when you're passing the peace, you see someone you don't know, um, someone who may be visiting, and if you'll just take that moment at the end of the service to approach them, reach out to them, um, tell them you're glad they're there. It makes a big difference, um, especially because sometimes people come to church because they're a little lost, um, and that word of kindness can make a big difference. A uh, few announcements. You've got this uh, pamphlet that was handed out as you came in. Um, there's just a couple things I want to highlight. Uh, next Saturday is Family Day at the Farmer's Market. If you haven't been to that, it is spooky and fun. They have special tables, treats, costumes. Next Saturday, fam Family Day, 8 to noon. Um, and the Family Day festivities begin at 10, so join us for that. Also on November 7th, which you might remember is almost a whole week after November 1st, is when we observe All Saints Day. Yes, I'm not trying to be too obvious. The fact is All Saints Day falls on November 1st, but we often transfer it to the Sunday following. Um, and the Reverend Dr. Bob Daniels will be back with us. He will preach um, at the 9 and 11 services. This service will keep on trucking, right? We do not stop just because of other things. The com contemporary service will continue right here. Um, there will be a reception at 10 a.m. in the Garden Cloister in case you would like to uh, greet Dr. Daniels and tell him hello. I will also mention, Chris was so bad in the annual meeting today, he looked at the list of uh, the stewardship, and he looked and he said, a lot of you have given, not all of you. I was like, where is he going? Anyway, see if your name is on here, and if not, please give to the campaign. We'd be very grateful. Um, Veterans Day. We're going to do it this year, but we're going to do it on Veterans Day on Thursday, November 11th. I will be leading that service with a lot of help from a lot of people, and that is when we honor um, our veterans in our parish. It's a special day, um, and so the information is there. Veterans Day, Thursday, November 11th at 530. If you or someone you know um, ser served in the military, it's a really great day uh, to be thanked for your service, but also to have God bless you in your serving. Um, so remember that. There was an annual, uh, w there's two meetings, there's biannual meetings of the church, and I'm happy to announce our new vestry members, Stuart Brown, Eric Gilmore, Carol Pierce, P Carol Pierce Goglia, Kelly Riddell, and Keller Webster, and the foundation, Stacy Malcolmson, David Martin, 
Grady Schleyer, Stuart Thomas, and Elizabeth Lee Thompson. These are some powerhouses. We're so grateful for their service to the Vestry and Foundation, and then also delegates and alternate delegates um, to convention are listed there as well. Some of you may know we're part of a diocese, which is just a bunch of parishes, and we have convention coming up, and I was nominated to uh, stand for election to executive council, and I share that with you not because I'm going to be elected. I may not be. It's not common for St. Michael people to be elected, but I share that with you to say, <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling the truth, people. It is good to say yes when someone asks, and you never know when there's a moment where some healing and some bridges can be built. And so I always try to say yes in those moments. Um, so think of me on the day after, you know, if I'm sad because I wasn't elected, just say a prayer for me. <laughs> Any other announcements we need to mention? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice.